Here comes the sun. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> it's not bad, eh? My pronouns are he, him. I study physics. Our virus is alive? Week five. Our evolution over the past four billion years. Last week was three billion. Now we're going back to four billion. To more towards the origin. What do you think of week five? I found it very interesting. I'd never thought of viruses as life or I just didn't really think about it. But now I actually saw the ma microbiology of them and I... I was very on your side of oh, why God. are they alive, yeah, because it does seem they are parasites in a way, and why aren't we all parasites? I did hold well, that's that. That's what I keep saying yeah. to people, that they're parasites, but they, nobody wants to believe that. I, I look at heterotrophs, and I say, oh my gosh, look at those parasites, but yeah. uh, people don't want to believe that they're parasites. No, it's, yeah. How can viruses be the frontier of life and viruses be the frontier of life if they're parasitic? Because aren't they parasitic off other life? Well, I guess the idea would be that before there was life, there were redox reactions, geochemical reactions, mm. that made energy, chemist, chemical energy free, and the idea is to somehow take advantage of that pre-existing chemical transitions. Okay. Now, in other words, that's the, it's kind of like pa being parasitizing off of the biochemical abiotic reactions is mm. the idea. That's for the energy. Interesting. As for uh, duplicating themselves, well, I guess that's what viruses do, right? Mm. But they'd have to have some source of energy, and I guess that would be the pre-existing geochemical energy, and that's the trick of how that, how that got matched. Yeah. Maybe there are viruses alive today that are doing that, and we're not aware of them. Uh, I'd have to get our geochemical experts to have a look, more careful look, I think. Yeah, interesting. that was sort of my thought throughout the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, it's, it's a good thought because... As just as we're, if, if there's this many bacteria, we've looked at this many, these are the ones that make us mm. sick. There are yeah. this many viruses, and we've looked at this many, and these are the ones that make us sick. Yeah. Because, of course, we're human centered. We only care about what makes white males sick. <laughs> Thank goodness for that. <laughs> if, yeah, that's a whole other thing. But, but. <laughs> but that is incredibly human centric, and mm. getting away from that human centrism is going to help us understand the origin of life, I think. Yeah, All definitely. Right. Okay, we're on the same page there. Yes. Now, I did, uh, yeah, unlearn something I thought I knew if I'm going to your next question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I didn't know that, I think you mentioned plasmids, but I didn't realize that they were the circular DNA in bacteria. I think mm -hmm. that was just one of those things that you could Well, they're not with. exactly, I mean, they're, they're circular. Plasmids are circular mm -hmm. and bacterial genomes are circular. And so it's kind of like we have miniature versions of, the, of bacterial genomes inside of us as plasmids, but they're usually called something different. And I guess if I were an expert, I could tell you the big differences between the DNA genomes and plasmids, okay. but they just seem similar to me. And uh, I'll uh, let some microbiologist uh, tell us why that's not exactly right, which is usually the case mm. in biology. <laughs> yes, definitely, every single time. And also they get the whole, are they alive thing, because it seems to me that they're alive. <laughs> well, well, I mean, I think I'm just influenced by your point of view. Well, well I did, my point of view is not that they're alive. My point of view is that there's no definition for life. Yeah, that's well, that's the whole Nietzsche, Nietzsche thing. Yeah, there, yeah well, it has I, a history cannot be. Yes, true. and I've never heard anybody else say that, so I'm going to take part, me and Nietzsche. <laughs> We're gonna, I'm defending his view of the point. It just seems to make yeah. sense to me because... Life evolves and anything that evolves is really hard or impossible to define. Mm. I just repeat that to myself. And the more I repeat it, the more it makes sense. And do you share that? Or? I think it's interesting, but then it's all about what humans need to like need to know or want to know. So it's all about frame of reference. So you can put, talk about life from like a certain time and talk about what this kind of life is, but you can't necessarily define all of life. Well, if we're trying to understand all of life, yeah. that's what this is about, yeah. we have to have the broadest framework. Yeah. We can't just be human-centric and be interested only in the bacteria and the viruses that give us diseases, yeah. but hey, how did those things come about? And uh, mm -hmm. there were no humans to give diseases to so yeah. in, the, in where, at the time frame that we're interested. Yeah, but I also thought the, um, like the different fundamentals of seven building blocks of life was also very interesting, and especially homochirality. There is a chirality to, to the amino acids and a chirality to the sugars. Mm. And that's seen as being very fundamental. And that matter of fact, that's one of the ways in which we could check to see if life on Mars, how deeply related it is to life here. Mm. Because if it doesn't share the same, same chirality, then, oh, it's more independent. Mm. How independent? That's another issue. Joachim and I talked about, uh, did we evolve late? Yeah, I agree... You don't tell me you agree with John. <laughs> you. Because I don't think there's, there is no schedule for life. I think there is probably like, uh, this could have happened, 
but that's not what has happened here. And it would depend on ev like every single rocky planet would have a different chemical composition. Well, well, that's kind of what I was saying. I was yeah. saying, no, there's no schedule. And he kept on saying, well, even if there's no schedule, there's at least a speed at which it's going. He was kind of going, there's a yeah. train. We know how fast it's going. Therefore, it should happen. Mm. And, and uh, so I, w I don't yeah. even think that that's necessarily the case, that you know how fast this train of evolution is going. Yeah. Because also you look at mass extinctions and you see, mm. is that a, like a statistical thing that every mm. few million, billion years, mm. a mass extinction happens? And is that part of the program scheduling? And is that really a delay then? Well, he, he was thinking that there is uh, some determinism to the progression of the environment mm. and to the nutrients available. And therefore, there that would be the deterministic factors that yeah. determine the schedule. I don't believe in determinism. That's very <laughs> communist, I think. Okay. As, in like, as in a very like, I'm okay. not like against communism. Anyway. Were you inspired in any way or highly motivated by anything? Yeah, I think I'm really going to look more into viruses and see what really distinguishes them from life. And I think there are a few I'm inspired to go look at more. Distinguishes them from life. Or what, what people say distinguishes yeah, okay. them from life. <laughs> okay. Because it's interesting. And then, yeah, but then will our circle of empathy extend to them? Because usually we don't extend our circle of empathy to things that kill us anyway. Mm, right, right, right. So... It's yeah, and then the it's whole important feature to stay alive. Yeah, and then also like con context, we're still in the height of COVID nineteen. Well, so I don't buy that thing about hey, they're parasites and we're not. I, yeah. Every time I hear that, I go. Phew. Yeah, but in terms of other distinctions, do you think there is a threshold between this non-life and life, even if that life is viruses? No, I don't. I think that uh, I think as a scientist, you are locked into the idea because you're not a supernaturalist, you are locked into the idea that there was non-life, and then something happened, something happened, something happened, and now we have life. Yeah, I just think that there's got to be some sort of one thing that switches. But maybe you're saying really? that it's more like gradual. What, I just, why yeah. do you think there's one thing? Just because you're so used to non-life and life? I think it's just because I am use the idea of like a mutation. So there must have been like one mutation that could have been that thing that sends it over and it's like oh that can be defined sends it as over sends it over maybe it, like it has a metabolism or maybe it has that one more thing that leads it closer to being defined i mean you can't really define life but being what we consider a life so you're form. a barrierist i'm always i've always been interested in like sort of a, like when is something cooked like oh. when is the exact second that something's cooked or, but that seems silly to me exactly i just always i'm it's, always interested in that really yeah just I'm, yeah you're a black and whitest Sort of. I understand that there's always gray areas, but it's interesting to think what's the exact like millisecond that you, something considered cooked. <laughs> okay. So okay. chicken and egg. Yeah. Chicken and egg though is very. Uh, you're, there's no hope for you there, Beck. No, <laughs> so. I know. I, I can't. I can't do anything with that. I mean, I don't think you're wrong. I think it's just not necessarily looking as hard at that area of time. Maybe like the there was a transition somewhere, and you acknowledge that. But I, I would. I'm more interested in the actual sort of what was happening there. Well, in the transition that you imagine, are you transitioning to what you call life or are you transitioning to something more specific like cellular life? Yeah, like what, what are the transitions there between all the different sort of stages? But I guess that's well, the Now you're saying of, transitions, now it's a plural. Yeah, I mean, cause, because that's the thing, it's a gray area. You don't have like one set thing that it's suddenly life. It's mm -hmm. many, many things. Well, let me ask you this question. Do you think in, let's say... I don't know, a million years of pe people stay alive or somebody stays alive, that people will look back at life today and say they're not fully alive. Just like we look back at viruses and say, oh, they're not fully alive because they can't do this and this and this. Well, in a million years, we'll be able to do a whole bunch of stuff and then we'll look back here, you know, 2021 and say, oh, they couldn't do that, therefore they're not really alive. They're, they're kind of like viruses. Well, I think they're parasites. We're looking a bit, if you say a billion years in the future, then maybe, because we're looking at four billion years back mm. but only a million years back there were still home like the ancestors of humans more recognizable ancestors of, of humans things are changing fast yeah. cultural technological evolution i know anthropocene everything <laughs> like that i also i had another question uh with the create like the synthetic biology and synthetic chemistry uh with cynthia was it created from nothing, or was that no, one no, of the no, knocked no. off ones? No, no, that was one. Of the okay, knockoff. so I was, I was thinking, that was yeah, a knockout. That was a knockout, and so then that, that the whole process yeah. that uh, Ventner used was knocking things out. Okay, yes, I just wanted to co confirm that because I was like, I think I would have heard if something had created something from nothing. 
That's well, right. That's right. Yeah. Well, we <laughs> you can... think you would have. <laughs> I thought week five was pretty cool. I, uh, we're going even baser, more basal, I should say. Mm -hmm. Going even deeper into this idea of what exactly life is, and that certainly has more applications to astrobiology. This is an area I don't know much about, so diving into it, I've really enjoyed. My favorite part by far, mm -hmm. Spiegelman's monster. Spiegelman's monster, yes. I should say Spiegelman's little monster, but that part was, mm, love that bit. Viroids, I didn't even know existed until mm. now, but Spiegelman's monster, by far my favorite. Right, so this is a, a really a long tradition. I mean, he's like a legend in biology that a lot of people don't know about, and it's a, I think it's just a really important concept because it's the idea of minimizing what is life. How much do you need? Is there a minimum? Yeah. And I'm convinced that there is no minimum, as you can see. And it's but, a reasonable thing to say, honestly. Well, I would say that very, very few people agree with me. Why, would you agree with me? And if so, why? Uh, once you get beyond a point, people probably have difficulty classifying it, but we're starting to look at that spectrum of life versus non-life being a sliding spectrum rather than a binary. Well, that's what I think is important, but most people, do again, do not yeah. agree with this. Well, I, I thought using viruses to introduce that was a really clever, I don't want to say applicable way to do it, but it was just an easy question you could say, are viruses alive? And that slides you into that spectrum rather nicely. Whereas if you said, is a hurricane alive? You get so many people saying no that you couldn't go well, into it. Since you like Spiegelman's monster, what did you think of the idea that you could just continue this process until you get nothing? It's interesting, because I'm not quite sure what you mean by nothing. Well, no nucleotide sequence was required to produce the nucleotide sequence once you had the... I'm not sure what kind of synthase it was, but it yeah. was something that would take nucleotides in the environment and put them together. Uh, yeah. And without nucleotide template to work from. I yeah, think that was the idea. And again, is that copying itself? I, I don't know. I don't either. Like, there's nothing to copy, so how can it copy itself? <laughs> it has evolved, therefore you can't define it. Now, yeah. would you buy that? This is a Nietzsche thing. It was a really good quote, and I think uh, in terms of saying what is and isn't life, that's a fair point. It's just, if you want to have the working definition of life that most biologists seem to run by, you can find a whole lot of things that fit into that, which they wouldn't normally call life, and that's pushing you towards that non-binary system. So, in terms of converting people to your idea of a continuous spectrum, I think, yeah, some things are helpful for that and some things you think, oh, well. Okay, I'll take that as, <laughs> I'm not sure how to take that. Well, a sliding spectrum of life is interesting. And in terms of applying that to actual biology, that's not quite as easy. Things like... Well, if, since you don't know what actual biology is, yeah. then, then that's the sliding scale. Okay. Uh, anything make you laugh? <laughs> a few. Everything makes you laugh. <laughs> I mean, I have to admit, you and Jochen are getting more and more animated as the weeks go by. So whose side are, were you on in the Jochen's, uh, why did we evolve so late? This whole argument about scheduling. Well, all right. I think there's a point to be made about you, I don't want to say you know, but you can pretty much guess that you couldn't evolve something before a certain point. So something like the Cambrian Explosion, you say, oh, why aren't there large, I'm going to say large here, why aren't there large animals before here? You say, oh, there's not enough oxygen. So, so skeptical, what, did you disagree with anything? I'm putting into a lot of opinions. I mean, this is a very yeah. opinionated, I mean, because it's such a speculative area, I'm putting in what I, my opinions into this. Yeah. Can you push back on some of these opinions? Well, there are a couple of things I certainly agreed with, which I liked. And there are a couple of things I, I okay. I'm not going to say I disagree. Give me those. Give me the parts you're either skeptical or you disagree. <laughs> well, I didn't think phages and phages, phages? Bacteriophages? I don't think the difference between phages and viruses was very clearly explained. I, again, I'm well, not sure. there is none. <laughs> Excuse <Bacteriophages>. me? <laughs> there, is, there is none. Bacteriophages are the viruses that prey on bacteria. So they're a type of virus? Yeah, yeah. And are they... They're the viruses that attack bacteria. Are they... A, Virus? Virus? Yes, those are called virophages. So Those are viruses of viruses. And how are they different to the viruses that they're preying on? Uh, I do not know. No, that's but right. I've I don't either. So. <laughs> <laughs> when you described, wait, viroids? Viroids, yeah. As living fossils. Mm. I thought that was 
It's an interesting thing to say, but I thought it was going a little bit close to your chimp trap idea. So when you have a living fossil, mm -hmm. I, I'm not quite mm -hmm. sure what you mean by that. If we say that viroids were the viroid-like thing, okay, was that at works. the base of the tree of life, and then four billion years later, there are still viroids. There are, it's because we don't know all the details of the evolution of that viroid-like thing into extant, current, living viroids. Yeah. So we don't know that, and so therefore we say, ah, that and that are the same. Yeah, so that's, that's what we're doing, and that's the that is the chimp trap as you successfully oh, identified. Oh, it, and you're right. So that's that's a really important. I'm really glad you pointed no, that out. Li living fossil is an interesting idea, but is that just that sounds like chimp trap bait? As you said, it is. It is. It is a chimp. But the whole point is sometimes it's true. In the <laughs> sense, <laughs> no, in the <laughs> sense that no, some that hurts. This, this, no, it doesn't hurt at all because there's no. I mean, sometimes. Remember we talked about genes and they duplicate. Yes. Right? So some, and then what did we say? We said one of those genes stays mm -hmm. the way it was and the other goes offline doo -doo 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 and evolves. So That's yeah. the chimp trap. It's like this one didn't evolve and this one did. Yeah. So the common ancestor is like this one. Right? Is it possible that the environment that Luca evolved in doesn't exist anymore? And how do we allow for that? So I have one colleague, David Schwartzman, who you saw that video of. Um, he thinks that the earlier it started out hot, and then life wanted to get started, it was too hot. Life wanted to get started, it was too hot. And then it cooled down a little bit, and as soon as it cooled down enough, boom, life got started. So there was a, like a thermal, it was like a sterilization, <laughs> continuous sterilization until the, the you turned off the sterilizer. And then life got started. So that's he's a more of a materialistic uh, explanation for the origin of life. Life started hot. Where would you put Cynthia on the tree of life? Uh, where would, would, you, would you put it on the tree of life? I would put it in the same place as a man with a hat. What? I would, you know, what is a man with a hat? He's got a hat on. That's not biological. He made it. And so Cynthia is something that's kind of, art, you call it artificial, <laughs> but humans are, humans are, uh, are uh, natural. So I don't believe in this distinction between natural and artificial. And so, so that's why I wouldn't have any problem at all. Yeah. But would you put a hat on the tree of life? Next to a human? Or you... Well, in the sense that, see, humans have modified their environment. Or, let's say, genetically, where would you put a genetically modified apple tree? Yeah. Tree of life. You know, it's there. Some, it, but the modification was done by selection. Artificial. You're asking, what's the difference between natural selection and artificial selection? Fair. And I would say nothing. Well, it, Darwin mm -hmm. would say there's something. Other people would say there's something. But I think humans are natural. Therefore, any type of artificial is natural. And so yeah. there's no, no distinction. And therefore, I have no problem with putting it on the tree of life. My question with Cynthia is, mm -hmm. a genetically modified apple tree, I would assume you'd put near apples, but well, apple trees. Mm -hmm. Where do you put Cynthia? Because I assume... By the mycoplasm that it started out as. So Cynthia started as a... Mycoplasm, yes. Okay, that helps. I was seeing their thing, they made it from yes. uh, nuts and bolts sort of deal. No, 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 no. no. Oh, well, no. that helps. If no. you did make it from nuts and bolts, where would it end up then? Well, how, what kind of nuts and bolts were you using? Let's say we built it from the atoms. Just to be the atoms, we, are you make? But are you going to make nucleotides? You're going to make. Depends on how you make it. Yeah. If you make it like a, are you going to make A, C, Gs, and Ts or not? Yeah. Well, let's okay. pretend it is the Cynthia, and it's made using a very well, very. Well, then you're just making a copy of life. So, it's, huh. so then you're just making a copy of a human being or a copy of a bacteria, a copy of a protein. I thought that using protein folding to dig deeper into the uh, tree of life was a really, really cool idea. Yeah, the idea that those are the most conserved things, even more yeah. conserved than sequences, is something that, yep. at least that's what I read, and I think it's true, but I should say that that is something that a lot of biologists, microbiologists, have pushed back on very hard. Okay, Murray, so week five, what did you think? This was another one of those weeks that like coming into this as a physicist, as someone who maybe doesn't have as robust a background in biology, I found really fascinating because it sort of, maybe it's the, the week that I unlearnt the one biggest thing I think coming into this. Oh, that's quite a compliment. Right? Because um, before, before doing this, I had heard of Luca, right? Because I feel like it's in science communication a fair bit. But in my mind, like Luca equaled start of life, right? Mm -hmm. There was no sort of ambiguity about that. Very well, common misconception. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> obviously, like introducing viruses and viroids and the gradient of life is some is like a nuance that, as someone who didn't have much experience with it, I completely ignored. So um, good job this week. Valuable <laughs> contribution to world culture. Huh? Yep. <laughs> 
good, good. So you unlearned that life is black and white? Is that what... Yeah, be- sort of. It, maybe it's less so that I unlearned it. It's just I actually spent time... Well, you tr- encouraged me to actually spend time thinking about it. Um, and going forward, it's obviously something that's very relevant to exobiology. You touch on the idea of virus worlds. And you and, and it's, it's kind of clear that early viruses existed before Luca. Right? It's, I well, wouldn't say it's clear, but I would say it's a very plausible mm-hmm. uh, default. It seems like it's an obvious sort of step on the chain towards what we would consider. I think it is, but yeah. I would say at least half of people who study viruses would not agree because okay. they will always invoke, hey, they have to parasitize something. If those, para- if those cellular life is not there beforehand, mm-hmm. there's nothing to parasitize, therefore they weren't viruses. That's, that's what you'll get again and again and again. That's what I wanted to ask you about. You mentioned vir- a virus world. Yes. Um, how exactly would that work mm-hmm. on, without the existence of cellular life? Or does that mean that there is cellular life, but it's just dominated by viruses? Well, uh, sometimes I say that viruses have learned to outsource their reproduction, their replication mm-hmm. of their information. And so if that's the case, then they had to, in an RNA world or a viral or very early viral world, they, have had, they would have had to learn to do that by themselves without parasitizing a cell, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the idea is, okay, how do you imagine, for example, people talk about RNA world, but very rarely do they talk about the metabolism of that RNA world. Okay. Because so, you need energy. You need to have a source of metabolism. You can't, mm-hmm. just rep- you, you can't just have a copying machine going without putting electricity into yeah, the copying okay. machine, right? So you need a electricity. So the point there is, I think, Wait a minute, we know there's redox availability. So the, the availability of energy in geochemical reactions that are occurring in non-equilibrium situations. Mm-hmm. That's why hydrothermal vents and hot springs are such important candidates because that's where they have these geoabiotic sources of free energy. Mm-hmm. And that's what you need to learn how to parasitize, if you will. And that's what has to be the, the, the equivalent of the cells that viruses are now parasitizing. Asking biologists if you think, if they think viruses are alive. Mm-hmm. Do you think that that's actually the important question? Or is it so much that, is it more so that we just need to have more nuance in the way that we think of what is alive? Well, both. Right? Well, the way you get to that nuance is by taking people's conceptions of either it's alive or not. That's mm-hmm. what every, almost everybody subscribes to. Mm-hmm. Then asking them, and then pushing back on these phony answers, Mm -hmm. and then they realize, I guess we don't know what life is. Mm -hmm. To arrive at the conclusion that you don't really know what life is, you have to look at the boundaries, like viruses, and get people to admit, yes, yes and no. And once they do that, then that boundary falls apart. Okay. That's that's more or less why I keep asking this supposedly stupid question. (laughs) Because, yeah, like we are focusing on sort of arranging for your own replication versus just your replication. And what, what is considered the environment or the cell. Mm-hmm. You know, Gaia is arguably human's cell that we're parasitizing to reproduce, right? But, um, like, do you think it's... Do you personally want people to say, like, is your... It, uh, do you think that it's important that people decide, yes, viruses are alive? Like, do you think no, viruses no, are alive? Not. Or do no, you think absolutely not. That's the whole they're point. Just, to, okay, to, yeah. They're to just on get the them to stop asking that question, yeah. realizing that there is a scale here. Okay. You know, anytime there's a zero-dimensional thinking, black and white, mm-hmm. anytime you can move that to one-dimensional thinking, you've made progress. Um, I also wanted to bring up the, uh, your, the Joking with Jochen segment this week, um, arguing precisely about the terminology of of oh, did, how, how, why did we take so long to evolve, or why did we evolve late mm-hmm. um, after yeah. the Cambrian explosion? We really had a yeah. <laughs> I do. I feel like maybe this is just. Are you going to take Jakin's side? No, I was going to say I actually think I take your side for once, <laughs> which I think might be a verse in these videos. <laughs> but I do understand Jakin's side in that um, the specific language. I feel like a lot of this course, to be honest, boils down to language and well, let me stop you there because yeah. that's what he would say okay he said over and over again it's just semantics just semantics but i would say it is definitely semantics but it's also the semantics that we use to describe our deepest emotions that is yeah, who we yeah, are yeah. that means it's not just semantics it's semantics representing our deepest mm-hmm. felt emotions mm-hmm. and that is more than semantics that's emotions okay. yeah yeah that's what i would say this week got me much more interested in biochemistry than I have been before. Mm-hmm. The spe- like the very specifics of how we jump from the, you know, perhaps f- like fatty acids to actually 
what we would call, what we would, might not call life, but we would call, we would consider to be higher on that gradient of life. You know, the first, the first viruses, the first viroids. That's something that has intrigued me and I want to dive a bit deeper into. Okay, you use the word higher. Now that makes me see a little different? red. <laughs> so what did you mean by higher? Because I've been pushing back on that word for a long time. Okay. You closer do, to humans? You want, is that what you mean? Do you no, know, like no, me on the I don't mean, I don't mean high. I mean, so like you, it, it was a graphic this week. It, it was a vertical graph, mm -hmm. right? Is and it you time? Had, what was the no, no, y axis? It was just life. It was no life at this end and life at this end and, and life was black and no life was oh, white. Oh yeah, it's a, well you actually know, it was a hard, it was turned oh, sideways. Oh, horizontal. Yeah. Okay, well that's, yeah. that's what I mean. Right. Like, Further into the into the murky area of what we might call life, mm -hmm. of what you might argue with someone passionately <laughs> to say, no, that's life, isn't it? I see. Okay. To be honest, my main thing was just like, how's it, how would a viral world work? You know, what what does a RNA world look like? Mm -hmm. That's a work in progress. Yeah. And it has to do with this transition from geochemical energy to the energy of a pre-existing living cell, which has to be either a heterotroph or phototroph or chemotroph. Mm -hmm. Chemotrophs, in fact, the whole idea of chemotrophy means you're getting your energy not from the photons of the sun, not from eating other critters, like a heterotroph, like we are, but from just sitting on a rock and taking advantage of the natural, either a pH gradient or a redox gradient, mm -hmm. and then using that. And that, so research into chemotrophy is something that I think is very important for understanding the first steps in the origin of life.